Hello everyone, welcome to today's live broadcast, Fundamentals of Flow Cytometry, From Fluorescence to Function. I am Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Thermal Fisher Scientific. Thermal Fisher Scientific is the world leader in serving science with revenues of 17 billion and approximately 50,000 employees in 50 countries. The company's mission is to enable its customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. Thermal Fisher Scientific helps its customers to accelerate life sciences research, solve complex analytical challenges, improve patient diagnostics, and increase laboratory productivity. Through its premier brands, Thermo Scientific, Applied Biosystems, Invitrogen, Fisher Scientific, and Unity Lab Sciences, the company offers an unmatched combination of innovative technologies, purchasing convenience, and comprehensive support. For more information, please visit www.thermofisher.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Jolene Bradford, MLS, ASCP. Jolene Bradford is an Associate Director for Strategic Collaborations in the Biosciences Division of Thermo Fisher Scientific in Eugene, Oregon. She joined the company in 2001 and has developed numerous new reagents and assays for the flow cytometry platform. Well versed in fluorescent assays, Jolene has provided numerous webinars and seminars on the topics and has been an invited instructor at many flow cytometry training courses and workshops in the US and abroad. More recently, she has been involved in developing acoustic cytometry and instrumentation and consults on applications. Prior to joining Thermo Fisher Scientific, she performed clinical laboratory testing as a specialist in hematology and flow cytometry. In 2014, Jolene earned the Certified Cytometr Cytometrist International Credential. I will now turn it over to Jolene Bradford for her presentation. All right, well, thank you for that nice introduction and welcome to everyone joining this webinar, Introducing Flow Cytometry. I'd like to start out by introducing the protein and cellular analysis business of Thermo Fisher Scientific. This is designed to really help meet all of your fluorescent needs, whether it's through instrumentation for flow cytometry, imaging, high content imaging, or for reagents, assays and antibodies to help you with your research. I'll be discussing the basics of flow cytometry today, just part of our commitment to you to help provide solutions with every step along the flow cytometry workflow, from designing your experiments through sample prep, different assays, to detection, data analysis, and on to service and support. So today we will be discussing the following topics. I'll be describing what flow cytometry is and go over fluorescence basics. We'll look at the components of a flow cytometer, look how data is displayed, discuss compensation and how to perform that, and then look at different types of controls that are needed for a flow cytometry experiment. So where does the term flow cytometry come from? Well, cyto means cell and metry means measurement. So cytometry means the measurement of a cell, very simply. The word flow is used because cells are measured as they flow through a fluid stream into a light source and are measured. Flow cytometers are used in a wide range of applications, and this makes it one of the most useful and versatile platforms available.
The flow cytometer performs analysis by passing thousands of cells per second through a laser beam and capturing the light that emerges from each cell as it passes through. The ability to perform measurements on single cells, thousands or even millions of cells in a sample makes flow cytometry a very powerful platform available. The data generated can be analyzed statistically by software to report on the cellular characteristics. And most of the measurements use some type of fluorescent label. Some of the advantages of flow cytometry, this records data from single cells. You can make measurements on large numbers of cells and populations of cells. Thousands of cells, even millions of cells can be analyzed very rapidly and rich statistical analysis on these cell populations can be achieved. And because it is single cells that are measured, it can reveal the heterogeneity within a population. There is the ability to multiplex, looking at many parameters at the same time. And this allows small subpopulations of cells to be identified. Flow cytometry is ideally suited for blood and other cells in suspension, but it's certainly not limited to cells in suspension as cells can come from uh, tumors or uh, samples that are uh, adherent cells. There is the ability to archive standardized files, and this gives the flexibility to be able to analyze and reanalyze data in the future. So fluorescence is the result of a process that certain molecules contain. These are called fluorophores. The absorption spectrum and the emission spectrum are both critical to understanding how flow cytometry works. A fluorescent probe is a fluorophore that is designed to localize within a specific region or respond to a specific stimulus. I'll go over all of these in more detail in the coming slides. So wavelength is the distance that light travels on one vibration cycle. The distance is expressed in nanometers. The visible light spectrum is composed of wavelengths of light ranging from approximately 400 nanometers up to 700 nanometers. Light waves with shorter wavelengths have higher frequency and higher energy. Light waves with longer wavelengths have lower frequency and lower energy. Flow cytometry is dependent upon the control, collection, and separation of light. So here's what fluorescence is. A fluorophore is a molecule that is capable of fluorescing. In its ground state, the fluorophore molecule is in a stable configuration and it does not fluoresce. When light from an external source, such as a laser, excites the molecule, the molecule absorbs the light energy. The energy absorbed if the energy is absorbed is efficient to uh, the molecule, it helps it to reach a higher energy state. And this is called the excited state. This process is known as excitation. Next, the fluorophore can rearrange itself from this uh, semi-stable excited state back to the ground state. And excess energy can be released and this is released as emitted light. The emitted light is of lower energy and thus longer wavelength than the absorbed light. So we can summarize this cyclical process as excitation of a fluorophore through absorption of light energy. Then there's a, a transient excited lifetime with some loss of energy and then a return of the fluorophore to its ground state, which is accompanied by emission of light. 
The emission maximum for the fluorophore is always at a longer wavelength, thus it has lower energy than the absorbed light or the excitation wavelength. And the difference between the excitation and the emission wavelengths is what is called the Stokes shift. Fluorophores can absorb a range of wavelengths of light energy, and this is called the excitation range. Fluorophores emit a range of wavelengths, and this is called the emission range. Within these ranges, there is the maximum for each, the excitation and the emission. And because the uh, excitation and emission wavelengths are different, the absorbed and the emitted light are detected as different colors on the visible spectrum. So this is an example of an excitation and emission spectra of the Alexa fluor 488 dye. Uh, the spectra of a, fluor, of a fluorophore contain important practical information about what wavelengths of light we need to supply and detect in order to use that fluorophore effectively. So here we see the excitation max is 494 nanometers and the emission max is 517 nanometers and the accompanied curves underneath those show the, the spectrum for each. So the excitation and the emission spectra must be examined carefully, especially when choosing two or more fluorophores in the same experiment, so that the fluorophores can be excited in a manner that will generate distinct emissions. Spectra viewers, like the one offered on the Thermo Fisher website, are very helpful with this. This is an example from the spectra viewer. And here again, we are looking at the spectra of two fluorophores, Alexafluor 488 and Alexafluor 647. I'm also showing the different wavelengths of lasers that are used to excite each of these individual fluorophores. The 488 blue laser, and the 638 red laser. So building on this, the emission spectra for both the 488 and the Lexafluor 647 floors are now added in. Our online uh, fluorescent spectra viewer can be very helpful for creating all of the different fluorophores in your experiment. Uh, and also for your convenience, there is a Spectra Viewer mobile app so that you can put it on your mobile device. So now I'm showing just the emission profiles of the two particular dyes, and I've added in the collection bandpass filters that are commonly used in flow cytometers. So you can see which portion of the emission spectrum is being collected by the instrument. So flow cytometry is a technology that can simultaneously measure and analyze many characteristics of single cells. It's basically composed of three components, the fluidics, the optics, and the electronics. Fluidics introduce the cells for interrogation with the laser. The optics generate and collect the light signals. And the electronics convert the optical signals to proportional electronic signals for analysis. So this shows the primary systems of the cytometer. The fluidics move the sample to the interrogation point, and then it also takes the sample off to waste. The optics include laser light source for light scatter and fluorescence, and also help to direct and gather the light in the detectors. And then finally, the electronics and peripheral computer system convert the signals from the detectors into digital data. So the purpose of a fluidics system is to transport the particles or cells in a fluid stream to the laser beam for interrogation. Most often, the sample is injected into a stream of sheath fluid. For optimal data quality, 
The particles should be in the very center of the laser beam. Only one particle should move through the laser beam at one time. And fluidic systems really need to be free of air bubbles and debris. So here is a diagram on the left of the fluidic stream. Here we see the sheath and the sample stream. On the right are the fluidic bottles that are associated with the Invitrogen Attune NXT flow cytometer. Uh, Benchtop cytometers like this are very popular now with the, all of the fluidics located on board. So the fluidic systems include the sheath fluid, which is usually a salt suspension. And in most systems, the cells are completely surrounded by the sheath fluid. The cells or particles in suspension flow in a single file through the laser beam where they scatter light and the, they emit fluorescence. So the excitation optics help create this illumination region. This includes lasers and diodes, includes lenses to help shape and focus the laser beam. The collection optics route the light signals to specific detectors and include a system of optical mirrors and filters to route the light to the designated detectors. This is a uh, laser light is a coherent light that is used by flow cytometers to um, excite fluorescent dyes and characterize the particles as they pass through the laser beam. So here we see some of the most commonly used laser excitation sources, but it's certainly not an exhaustive list of laser wavelengths. And as systems become more complex and have the ability to measure more and more parameters, the number of lasers per flow cytometer can increase. In multi-laser cytometers, they have, generally speaking, spatially separated lasers so that each cell passes through each laser interrogation point at different times. The information obtained at each laser interrogation point is aligned over time so that it can be recorded at the same time for each cell. And this timing coordination is called laser delay. There are some flow cytometers that use collinear lasers instead, but this complicates uh, emission and dye selection and can complicate data interpretation. So generally speaking, spatially separated lasers are preferred. So this is an example of optical filters on the left that are put in place to help direct the appropriate laser light to the appropriate detector. And then uh, PMT detectors are shown on the right that capture that light and then convert it into pulse signals. As cells pass through a laser, it refracts or scatters light in all directions. Light scattering occurs when the particle deflects the laser light. The extent to which this occurs depends on the physical properties of the cell or the particle, namely its size and internal complexity. Forward scatter is also called low angle light scatter. And this is the light that is scattered in the forward direction as laser light strikes the cell. The magnitude of the forward scatter is roughly proportional to the size of the cell or particle, but it's not an absolute measurement. Side scatter is defined as the light that is scattered at larger angles. Generally speaking, side scatter is collected 90 degrees from the laser's light path. Side scatter is indicative of granularity and structural complexity inside the cell or on the surface of the cell. Just using light scatter, such as uh, these plots here sh showing forward scatter and side scatter two parameter plots, 
just these alone can help with the differentiation of different cell types in a mixed cell population. So on the left, we have lysed whole blood. And again, this is no fluorescent parameters, but we can see three distinct populations of cells. And on the right, we see some cultured Jercat T cells. And this, these are aged so that there is a significant dead cell population. And you can see a shifting of uh, population just based on the forward and side light scatter. So the interrogation point is really the heart of the system. This is where the laser and the sample intersect. And the optics that collect the resulting light and uh, light scatter and the fluorescence occur. So for accurate data collection, it's important that the particles or the cells are passed through the laser beam one at a time. Most flow cytometers accomplish this by injecting the sample stream containing the cells into a flowing stream of sheath fluid or saline solution. With hydrodynamic focusing, the sample is injected into a stream of sheath fluid where it is completely surrounded by the sheath. The sample core is then centered within the sheath fluid. Based on principles relating to laminar flow, the sample remains separate but coaxial with the sheath fluid. The flow of sheath fluid accelerates the particles and restricts them to the center of the sample core. And this process is known as hydrodynamic focusing. At a low flow rate, the sample core is very narrow and the particles interact with the laser beam in an optimal manner. To increase the flow rate in a hydrodynamic system, the speed of the sample core does not change, but rather the width of the sample core within the fluid stream widens. And this allows more cells to enter the core stream at a given moment. Within, with a wider sample core, however, some cells will pass through the laser beam off center and intercept the laser in a less than optimal manner and this creates variability of signal. This results in a wider distribution of data and the resolution is decreased. This limitation, this trade-off of speed and sensitivity has largely been accepted by the flow cytometry community. So to obtain optimal data with the lowest signal variability, a conventional flow cytometer must be run in the lowest sample rate. In 2010, a breakthrough advancement was introduced. This uses acoustic sound waves to very gently place the cells in the middle of the fluid stream, regardless of speed or sample core width. Acoustic assisted hydrodynamic focusing places the particles into the center of the sample stream. It's pre-focused and then injected into the sample stream, which then provides additional hydrodynamic pressure to place the sample prior to interrogation with the lasers. So the combination of these two forces results in narrow particle stream and very uniform laser illumination, regardless of the sample input. So this allows uh, no compromise between data quality and sample flow rate by uncoupling the cell alignment from the sheath fluid, from the sheath flow. So flow rates uh, unimagined before are now possible up to 10 times faster. And high quality data is still maintained at these faster flow rates. So this is an end on view of a capillary running five micron fluorescent beads, first without the acoustic forces, and then with the acoustic forces applied, you can see those beads go directly to the center of the stream. The acoustic forces are taken off and then applied again. So again, you can see how these uh, particles go directly to the center of the fluid stream. 
So finally, we have the electronics. And these electronics function to convert optical signals to proportional electronical signals. This is also called voltage pulses. They allow us to analyze the voltage pulse height, area, and width. And then we interface with the computer for transfer of data and analysis. So as particles pass through the laser beam in a fluid stream, light signals are generated. And these signals are converted to electronic signals in the detectors. A voltage pulse is created. So the data is processed to simultaneously calculate the pulse area, the pulse height, and the pulse width. So the height of the pulse is the amplitude of the peak. The area is the integrated signal under the pulse peak. And then the width is the time that it takes for the cell to pass through the laser. Many cytometers will actually calculate the width parameter. However, it is directly measured with the Attune NXT. So fluorescence data is collected in generally the same way as we collect forward and side scatter. In a population of labeled cells, some of them will be brighter than others. As each cell crosses the laser, a fluorescent signal is generated. The fluorescent light is directed to the appropriate detector, where it is then translated into a voltage pulse that is proportional to the amount of fluorescence light that has been emitted. So flow cytometric data is stored according to defined standards called flow cytometry standard files or FCS files. This allows for a common and consistent language to describe the flow cytometry data. The name list mode file is sometimes used because the data are acquired as a list of values for each parameter or from each detector. So a histogram is a very common form of data presentation. A histogram allows for the view of a single parameter against number of events. It can also be called a single parameter plot. They come in a variety of different sizes and shapes depending on the data that is being acquired as seen in the examples uh, at the bottom here. So lines can be drawn around a population in order to distinguish them from one another on a histogram. And then two parameter plots are often called dot plots or density plots. So here we see the exact same data shown as a dot plot and as a density plot. So this is a type of graphical representation of two parameter data where each axis represents the signal intensity of one of the parameters. And each dot in the plot corresponds to one of the cells. The density plot takes this and adds signal intensity to the display. Two parameter can also be called bivariate plots. And here's some additional examples of a density plot on the left and a dot plot on the right. Regions and gates are commonly used to help define and identify different populations in a multicolor experiment. Uh, the most popular application is to use gates in a sequential order so that you can limit the data display and define the parameters for statistical uh, analysis. So this is, a, is an example of using a gate. So here we have a mixed population in the plot on the top. A region is drawn around the lymphocytes. And then 
the plots on the bottom are gated on the lymphocyte. So this display would reflect the fluorescence properties of only the lymphocytes. So compensation is a process by which spillover fluorescence is removed from the secondary parameters so that fluorescent values for the a parameter reflect only the fluorescence of the primary fluorophore. The potential consequence of uncorrected spillover is a false positive signal. It is possible to eliminate this electronically by removing the signal through a process called compensation. Uh, although many instruments and software packages can perform an automated compensation of, for researchers, it is still important to understand the basic principles. So let's look at what fluorescence is and how to compensate for fluorescence uh, spillover. So in a perfect world, uh, the fluorescence emission profile for each individual fluorophore would be a very narrow, intense peak uh, that are well separated from each other, something like what we see here. In reality, however, the fluorophores have broad emission peaks. So here we see the emission profiles of the Alexafluor 488 dye and the R phycourethrin or RPE dye. For in proper interpretation of the data collected, we need to be sure that the light being recorded for the Alexa Floor 488 dye is really coming from the Alexa dye and not from RPE. And to accurately record the fluorescent signal for a given fluorophore, we need to correct for the emission signal. And this correction is called compensation. So the cytometer records fluorescence using an emission filter chosen to correct to collect the maximum amount of light coming from the fluorophore of interest and to exclude as much light as possible from other fluorophores. So here we see the Alexa Fluor 488 fluorescence being collected with a 530 nanometer bandpass filter. And the RPE fluorescence is being collected with a 585 bandpass filter. While each of these filters efficiently captures the emission peak of the target fluorophore, each bandpass also collects a little bit of the other fluorophore due to the spectral over, overlap of the emission profiles. And this overlap is shown here in red. So for this pair of fluorophores, the amount of spectral overlap of the Alexa dye into RPE is greater and requires more compensation than the amount of spectral overlap generated from PE into the Alexa floor detect detector. So in order to see the amount of compensation that is required to collect for this fluorescence overlap, we need single color samples, either aliquots of the same cell sample stained with each fluorophore separately or microspheres that capture an individual reagent. So in this example, we see a single color control and we have cells that are labeled with only the Alexa Fluor 488 dye. It is, however, a two parameter plot with the PE fluorescence displayed on the Y axis. We see both a positively, positively labeled population with a very bright fluorescence and also a negative population. However, these same cells emit fluorescence into the PE detector, and this results in this apparent upward shift of the population where there is no compensation applied. So when you see cells on this diagonal, you often think of cells or the experiment has not had compensation applied. So this signal uh, occurs this way because the tail of the Alexa floor emission has the right wavelength to be collected in the PE detector. And this incidental collection of the Alexa floor fluorescence into the PE detector 
could erroneously increase the amount of PE signal assigned to the cells if left uncompensated. So the plot on the left shows uncompensated data, while the plot on the right shows what the data looks like after correct compensation has been applied. And although the signal is real, we are detecting real light fluorescence that is coming from the 488 dye, but it cannot be correctly assigned to the RPE label or the RPE detector. So let's talk about how to compensate. A negative control is used to mimic, mimic the background fluorescence. Uh, this can include um, autofluorescence, any non-specific binding, and any non-antigen specific binding. The positive fluorescence is always relative to the negative fluorescence. A negative control can either be unlabeled cells or a microsphere or it can be um, isotype cells. So to set compensation properly, the use of a single color positive control is required. For each fluorophore used in the experiment, a sample with just that one fluorophore is prepared and the fluorescence is then collected in all of the detectors used in the experiment. This way, the fluorescent spillover into all of the other uh, detectors can be determined. It does need to be the exact same fluorophore that you're using in the experiment. For example, APC and Alexa Fluor 647 are two fluorophores that are collected in the same detector, but the spectra of the two are different and they will produce different compensation values. If you're using a tandem dye, it is recommended that you use the exact same lot of tandem due to the high variability of making the tandem itself. So different lots of tandem dyes can produce different compensation values. The same cells that are being tested in the experiment can be used as a positive control. However, cells can be problematic if there is a low or absent expressing antigen. Antibody capture beads can be used and these provide some advantages. They can use the same reagent. There are lots of positive events that are very bright. And remember compensation controls, the positive must be matched to each experiment and it needs to be at least as bright as the reagent or the expression of that reagent used in the experiment. So in summary, for compensation, single color controls are needed for each fluorophore in the experiment. The positive needs to be at least as bright as the experimental sample. It needs to be spectrally matched to the experimental reagent and the positive and the negative controls are matched for background fluorescence. When we talk about experimental controls, we typically talk about the single color compensation controls, which I've just described, FMO controls, and a positive or biological sample control. So compensated data can result in unexpected fluorescence distribution called spread. And this spread of data can preclude adjustment of the signal down to the level of the autofluorescence found in unlabeled cells. So use of staining controls that include all of the reagents except for the one of interest are called fluorescence minus one or FMO controls. And this allows for a precise definition to delineate the positive and negative populations. And it also helps adjust for the spread of the data. Isotype control antibodies uh, have no specificity for the target cells within a particular experiment, yet they retain the nonspecific characteristics of the antibodies used in the experiment. Although widely used in the past, their use 
today is somewhat controversial. Their purpose is to confirm the specificity of primary antibody binding that is not a result of nonspecific FC binder, FC receptor binding to cells or to other cellular protein interactions. Uh, the isotype antibody ideally matches the primary antibody's host species or isotype and conjugation format. Uh, and that's needed to accurately assess, uh, assess the level of specific binding. FMO controls are really more accurate for marker placement than using isotype controls and are generally preferred these days. And then finally, a biologic, biological control that provides biologically relevant information should be included to ensure your sample preparation, uh, staining, compensation, and gating are performed as expected. So this brings us to the end of our webinar. Thank you for joining me today. And I think we have some time for a few questions. Thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is, can you explain what autofluorescence is? Sure. So, um, sure. so uh, autofluorescence is a term that is, has been given to describe the nat natural fluorescence that occurs in cells. Uh, autofluorescence contributes to the background signal and uh, so thus it, it can uh, be a factor in the separation of separating positive and negative signals. Um, it basically can decrease the functional signal resolution. Uh, larger cells have uh, more autofluorescence in general than smaller cells. And uh, laser wavelengths that are lower generally produce higher autofluorescence. Why is it recommended to titrate antibodies? Uh, yeah, that's a, a great question. Um, so uh, titration is, is really a, a process of identifying the best concentration to use an antibody for a given assay. Vendors can make uh, general recommendations uh, for guidance on what concentration to use, but it may not be appropriate for your specific assay. Um, doing an antibody titration is really one of the most basic uh, tests done in flow cytometry. Uh, the process is fairly simple. Um, uh, keeping the cell concentration constant and also keeping the conditions of labeling constant, such as uh, temperature and time of incubation, even the volume of the reaction. And then you can make changes in the concentration of the antibody used. And you can look at the difference between the positive and the negative signal, uh, make calculations around uh, signal to background or uh, staining index to really find uh, the most optimal uh, titer of the antibody or concentration of antibody that's used for your particular experiment. What is sorting? So I, I think there was a question around um, what is sorting? And I really didn't address what sorting is. 
Um, so a sorter is um, a type of specialized flow cytometer that can separate cells and then collect them for downstream studies. Um, most common, the most common type of sorting has a uh, piezoelectric vibrating mechanism that causes the stream of cells to break into individual droplets. And each droplet will ideally have one cell. Um, just before the stream breaks into droplets, uh, the fluorescence is measured and uh, an electrical charge is placed on a droplet that contains the cell of interest so that it can be deflected for collection. So there's uh, newer sorters that are coming onto the market that use um, microchip based sorting and uh, there's a, a whole variety of sorting options from very simple to very uh, complicated uh, instruments. Okay, we have time for one last question, and it is, I've heard that it is important to eliminate dead cells. What does this mean? Uh, so, so that's a great question. Um, especially with immunophenotyping experiments, um, it's really important to identify dead cells so that you can uh, take them out of your data analysis. And this is because antibodies have been shown to non-specifically bind to dead cells, and this can give you a false positive rating. Uh, so using a dead cell stain um, to help identify dead cells, uh, you can gate them out and make your, your data much more accurate. There's uh, really two ways to do this. There are impermeate nucleic acid dyes that can be added to your cell prep as the last step and not washed out. There's a number of choices like the Cytox dyes or propidium iodide, uh, and these can be uh, used to help uh, in your experimental design. There's also the live dead fixable amine reactive dyes. So these are actually fixable so that you can use these with, um, with experiments that use fix and perm and looking at intracellular targets. Uh, there, all, all of these dyes come in a variety of colors so that you can um, use them in whatever experimental design and however many colors you have for your experiment. And I would suggest, um, again, using a spectra viewer to put these into your experimental design. So basically, it's um, identifying dead cells so that you can eliminate them from your data analysis to create the most uh, accurate data that you can. I would like to once again thank Jolene Bradford for her presentation. Do you have any final comments? Thank you everyone for joining us today. And I just wanna thank everyone for joining me today. And I'd like to remind you that there are a number of other webinars on the Thermo Fisher website around flow cytometry. These range from topics like proliferation, apoptosis, microbiology, and panel design. So I uh, look forward to uh, interacting with you in the future. Thank you. Thanks again. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through June 28, 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.